If you'll turn in your Bibles one last time in this study to the book of Hebrews. And as you turn there, I'm going to give us a little quiz this morning. And uh, I hope everybody gets the first answer right. What book of the Bible are we finishing today? <laughs> okay, y'all are, y'all are very good listeners there. All right, so uh, what year did we start studying the book of Hebrews? 2019, very good. All right, this one's a little harder. What month of 2019 do you remember, or do you want to guess, more likely, uh, did we start studying through the book of Hebrews? May. Who said, did you say it? Look, at, we're gonna, you get a free bottle of hand sanitizer uh, on your way out. Just find the one with the least amount in it. You can take that home. All right, let's get a little harder here. What, uh, what Sunday, I want to ask you the date, which Sunday in May, the first, second, third, or fourth Sunday in May, did we start our study? Not the third. Not the fourth. You're getting closer, though. Not the second, but the first. Yes, isn't that amazing? Y'all all remember that so well. Uh, yes, 13 and a half months ago, uh, we started walking through the book of Hebrews together. And when you think about that for a moment, uh, consider how much has changed in the last 13 and a half months. If you go back and just look at the news stories from 2019, there's a lot that took place in May and June and July last year that most of us don't even remember. In fact, we might not remember much of 2019 because of the intensity of what's taken place in 2020. Uh, There is so much that is going on in our world today uh, that is different than what was going on in the world a year ago. Uh, As Pastor Nick was praying, we've got all these issues with uh, COVID-19. We've got issues with uh, a lot of unrest in our nation, injustice. We have protests in the streets. We have uh, looting and rioting in the streets. And the climate that we are in today, now, in June of 2020 is a different climate than what we were in in May of 2019. Things have changed. But for us as followers of Jesus Christ, as people of the Word of God, we should take great comfort because God's Word has not changed. God's Word is just as true today in June of 2020 as it was in May of 2019. God's word is just as helpful and useful and necessary for us and life-giving to us today as it was then. And I mention that point because we live in a culture and in a context where people are always trying to find something new for our problems. They're always trying to find new solutions, new ideas, new books, new thoughts, whatever it might be, to to solve the current crisis that we find ourselves in. But friends, as people of the word, we must understand that we don't need something new today. We need the age-old word of God. We need the truths that have been handed down through generations. Truths that we need today just as much as we needed them in May of 2019 and just as much as we will need them every day until the return of our Lord Jesus. I realize that we are in a climate today when many of you this morning may feel anxious and many of you today may feel worried. You may turn on the news even for 30 seconds and walk away from it feeling a sense of unrest and a lack of peace and worry. Some of you in your entire lifetime, you've not witnessed things like we, were, we are witnessing today. Well, I hope today that in the midst of that unrest and that anxiety and that worry, that you and I can take a moment to be encouraged. Because friends, in the world we live in, there's always been unrest. And the world that we live in, there's always been injustice. In the world that we live in, there has always been wickedness and violence. But God has given us an answer and God has given us a hope. And it comes through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I'm not here necessarily to teach you anything new. But I'm here to remind you of some truths that we can so easily forget. 
Because that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews does now as he comes to the end of this letter to these believers, these Hebrew Christians. Uh, Again, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of believers who had come from a Jewish background who are now being persecuted in their faith. And many were being tempted to become apostate, to leave their faith in Jesus Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews has gone to great length to help them to understand the big picture of God's word and the big picture of God's will. And now in these closing verses, he gives them and he gives us today some much needed reminders. One of my favorite quotes I have it in my office and I've said it before comes from a 18th century writer, Samuel Johnson. And he says, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. And so I hope today these will be some very helpful reminders to you. Now, something that I learned last week, and I'm not sure that it's going to be any different while we're in this context, that this is a very odd place to preach. Um, For one, you are back row Baptist, even in the church gym. Exhibit A. Uh, Two, for many of you, I can't read your facial expressions, and maybe that's a good thing right now. Maybe some of you are scowling and frowning, and I don't know. I'm just imagining everybody's got a smile on their face. But but it's an awkward atmosphere to preach in. So I'm going to ask you to do something I've never asked before in the entire time I've been here in the 10 years I've preached. I remember, I'll never forget, in a seminary class I'm preaching once, the, the teacher said, if you have to ask for an amen, you don't deserve one. And I've never asked anybody to say amen. But for the love of all things today, if you could do something, if you want to throw a hand up in the air, if you want to throw something at me, if you just want to say something so that I know you're alive, awake, and alert in this kind of stale setting that we're in as we look to the Word of God. And I understand we are not Pentecostal, we're not charismatic, but I promise you, if you say amen today, nobody's going to stare you down, they're not going to write your name down, they're not going to question anything. So, So if you are able to respond... That would be helpful, at least to me, and maybe to your neighbor. Amen? Amen. There we go. All right, we're off to a good start. Okay, well, uh, point one there in your outline. First reminder we have here from God's Word in Hebrews 13. A much-needed reminder for us today. We have a God of peace. Amen? Amen? Amen. Verse 20. Now, may the God of peace. Now, this comes in a common benediction. The benediction at the end of the New Testament letters often will include words like this. May the God of peace. This reminder to us that our God is a God of peace. For example, in Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says in verse 33, may the God of peace be with you all. Now when we think of peace, we tend to think about tranquility and and calm and, and the absence of unrest. But that's not necessarily the type of peace that the Apostle Paul and others are speaking to us about when they say the God of peace. And we see that in the context of Romans 15 and 16. Because as Paul goes on at the end of Romans to give this benediction, not only does he say, may the God of peace be with you all, he continues in chapter 16 to say, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, remember again the context here in Hebrews. In Hebrews, the writer is addressing people who have been persecuted for their faith. The writer is addressing people. Some of them have had their property plunder. Just imagine this for a moment. And this isn't hard for us again because of the day of unrest we live in. Imagine if these riots that we've seen in big cities and in Louisville, if they're on the streets of Bloomfield. Imagine that they're on your farm at your home. Imagine you're seeing your property destroyed and your property plundered and you are seeing violence and wickedness all around you. And then you get a letter from a believer trying to encourage you in your faith. And they say, may the God of peace be with you. And in that moment, you might not feel like your experience is one of peace. But this is a much needed reminder in a time of unrest. Because the God of peace brings about peace by destroying and crushing every enemy there is. 
The God of peace brings peace because enemies have been destroyed. The context, the picture here is of a king at the end of battle who has obliterated the enemy and obliterated the other kingdom and now there can be peace. This is not a negotiated peace. This is not a treaty of peace. This is a peace that comes when an enemy is destroyed. And friends, we, as followers of Jesus, we understand that an enemy has been destroyed. We understand that the gospel teaches us that our Lord Jesus on the cross destroyed the enemy of sin and death so that we might have peace. And that's the kind of peace that we're reading about here at the end of Hebrews. It's a peace that comes because our enemies will be destroyed. Now in the context we live in today, we still see very much there are enemies that are alive and well. We see, still see wickedness and we see sin and we see times when it feels like that wickedness and sin is gonna overtake everything. But we need to be reminded that we have a God of peace. We need to have a reminder that God is victorious. And we need to be reminded that one day every last enemy will be destroyed. And especially in days when we don't feel like we're at peace. That's why Jesus says in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So friend, if you are a blood-bought follower of Jesus Christ today, you can have peace in the midst of tribulation because Christ has overcome the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Point two, Jesus is our great shepherd. Verse 20 goes on to say, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, We're reminded here that Jesus is the great shepherd who protects and who leads his sheep. It is what Jesus says in John chapter 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And so we see two things here very clearly about Jesus as our shepherd. One, he protects us. Two, he leads us. I read a book a a number of years ago. I've recommended it to many of you by uh, a man named Tim Laniak. The book is called While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks. Uh, Dr. Laniak is a seminary professor, and for his doctoral studies, he actually spent uh, quite some time living with Bedouin shepherds and observing what the life of a shepherd was. And as he did that, he was able to unpack so much in the scripture, this, this narrative and this picture of what it really means for a shepherd to take care of the sheep. Hey, he talked in that book about the great lengths the shepherd goes to to protect the sheep especially at night when the sheep are resting, how they would gather all the sheep together. And, and many times they were, they were traveling and they weren't in an area where they could suddenly just build a fence. So many times they would actually tie all of the sheep together to protect them and keep them with one another. And then the sheep were able to rest. But he said, while the sheep were resting, the shepherd never did. The shepherd kept watch. Because the shepherd knew, especially at night, when those sheep were vulnerable, that there were attacks from wolves. And while those wolves were out there, the shepherd was awake and the shepherd was alert to protect the sheep from that danger. Friends, there's a picture there of what our great shepherd does for us. We can rest and we can sleep knowing we have a great shepherd who never sleeps. We can go through the unrest and the turmoil and the uncertainty of this world knowing that we have a great shepherd who is protecting us and watching out for us and caring for us. And not just that, we have a great shepherd who is leading us. The shepherd, Laniac said, would, would lead the sheep and the sheep would follow because the shepherd was the one, especially in these dry climates that they were in, who could lead the sheep to water. They could lead the sheep to food. And so the sheep learned to follow the shepherd because the shepherd was leading them to provision. 
And friends, that's exactly what our Lord Jesus does for us. That's why Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That is a picture for us today as believers of what it looks like to follow our shepherd. For example, it begins there in Luke 9.23 with denying ourselves. Now, I'm not going to ask for a verbal testimony this morning. I know I've already asked for a witness, but I'm not going to ask you to answer this one. But just think about it for a second. What have you denied yourself of recently in order to follow Jesus? What is a tangible piece of evidence in your life that you can point to? Well, what is an action, an attitude that you have found yourself turning from and denying yourself so that you could better follow Jesus? Well, what is something you've been tempted with that you have said no to so that you might follow Jesus? Friends, to follow Christ means to deny ourselves. We live in a culture and in a context and in a world that says, you don't deny yourself, you do whatever satisfies yourself. And the gospel says the very opposite. And if you can't put your finger on anything in your life that in recent days, weeks, or months that you've said no to, that you've denied yourself, then the question that comes to surface is, are you truly following Jesus, the great shepherd? Or are you just a sheep out there on your own? It says, if anybody will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That for us is the very real picture of publicly identifying ourselves with the cross of Jesus Christ. That is being a verbal witness to the gospel. That is taking up the cross. That is suffering for the sake of the gospel. That is enduring ridicule and persecution for the sake of the gospel. And again, ask yourself, when's the last time that happened? Now, we live in a very different context than many of our brothers and sisters in the faith who are facing the persecution that these Hebrew Christians were facing. But we very much live in a context where we will be ridiculed for our faith should we take a stand for it. And we live in a context where it is not comfortable to take a stand on the gospel. Have you been made uncomfortable in recent days, weeks, and months? Have you found yourself in a conversation where you didn't participate in the conversation others were having in the wickedness and that you even stepped into that conversation to talk about the gospel? Have you found yourself in a context in a situation where you verbally were sharing the gospel with someone and it became very uncomfortable? Friends, that's what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We will not win the world to Christ by simply saying to them, Walk or watch how I walk, don't listen to how I talk. We have to give a verbal witness and we have to live it out as well. That's what it means to be a follower of the great shepherd. And 30 says, Come after me, deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. To, to follow Jesus means we listen to his words and we live in obedience to him. That not only are we denying ourselves and turning from sin, but we are following Christ and obeying his commands. Again, the question for us is, can, can you think of a command that the Lord Jesus has given in his word that you have directly followed in recent days and weeks? A time when you've opened up the word and as you've read it, you've been brought to conviction and repentance. You've been brought to faith and obedience. You've seen a word to not only listen to, but to obey. That's what it means to be a follower of the great shepherd. Third reminder, we are saved by an eternal covenant. We are saved by an eternal covenant. Again, verse 20 goes on to say, this God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of an eternal covenant. So the book of Hebrews, if you've walked through this with us, there's been a lot here about offerings and about blood offerings and about the Old Testament and about how all those things point us forward to the cross of Jesus Christ and how we come into this covenant relationship with God through the blood of Jesus. This covenant is sealed through the blood of Jesus. And not just that, this covenant is eternally sealed because of the blood of Jesus. This is why the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9.15, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. 
I want you to think for a second about the covenants that man make with one another, the covenants, the contracts, you might think of it that way, that we enter into. Now, let's say you're in some type of business deal with someone and there's a negotiation made and contracts are signed. Is that deal eternally secure? And the answer is so often no, it's not. That there's loopholes, there's stipulation, there's clauses that can get you out of that deal. There's people who might go back later and, and sue for one reason or another. There's fine print that has to be followed. So often we th see these things are temporary and are temperamental. But we see in this covenant that God makes with man, it is neither temporary nor temperamental. It is eternal and it is secure. And yet we still, we still today in the church of Jesus Christ have so many who struggle to understand what it means to be in an eternal covenant with God. You will still find, and perhaps some of you this morning, struggle with this idea of eternal security, this idea that once you are saved, that you are eternally secure, this thought that we might lose that which we once had. And I believe this comes from an unbiblical understanding of the gospel. Because what we see here very clearly is that this eternal covenant is eternal. That this eternal covenant is a covenant that God keeps and secures. As one pastor said, if we could lose our salvation, we would. Amen? We would lose it every day of the week. We would lose it while we're preaching and we'd lose it while we're listening. If we had the power to lose this, we would. But friends, the power does not come from us. The power comes from our sovereign creator, God. He is the one who holds us. He is the one who keeps us. And that is why we read in 1 John 5, verse 11, this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has the life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have the life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. But here's the question. Well, what about the person who grew up in church and they walked the aisle and they were heavily involved in the youth group and they, they went on the mission trips and they went to the other side of the world to tell people about Jesus but today they don't want to have anything to do with God. They don't want to have anything to do with God's people. They don't want to have anything to do with God's church. Is that not a picture of someone who lost salvation? And friends, I think the scripture points us in this direction. That is a picture of someone who never genuinely had salvation. And we read in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us because they were never of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have stayed with us. But they went out that it might become clear that they were never of us. And we need that clarity in the church today. Because when someone goes out from us, we should not sit back with some false assurance and false comfort of, well, they're really okay and maybe they'll come back one day. No, we need to pursue them with the gospel of Jesus Christ like we've never pursued anybody before. And we need to plead with them for the cause of their eternal soul that they might repent and they might trust in Christ. The whole picture in the book of Hebrews is a picture of perseverance and of endurance, of running that we might finish the race. And we can see testimony after testimony after testimony of those who might have started out strong, but they're not on course anymore. And that is evidence to us that we need to go and plead with him about the gospel. Now hear me on this. I don't have some type of supernatural vision where I can look out there at the hearts of men and women and tell you who is genuinely saved and who is genuinely lost. I can't give anybody this morning assurance of your salvation. That is a work of the Spirit, and that is a testimony of the Word of God. But what I can do and what you can do is we can look at the fruit, and the fruit reveals the root. And there, if there's no fruit of a gospel understanding in a person's life, if there's no fruit of a gospel work in a person's life, then friends, let's stop treating them like someone who understands the gospel. And if that's evidence in your life today, 
If you're here going through motions and coming to church, but, but you don't look any different than the world around you, you're not getting some gold star when you get to heaven because you made it to church today. We are to plead with you for the case of your eternal soul that you might come to understand the goodness and the glory of the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place of death. You deserve and I deserve that we might have eternal life. He is the full and final sacrifice for our sin and we are called to put our faith and our trust and our hope in Him. And that does not mean then that we are suddenly these perfect Christians. No, what that means is we now have faith in a perfect Savior. And He will lead us home. Friends, we are to celebrate that and we are to call others to it. Number four, we are equipped to do the will of God and to please God. Verse 20 again, that the God of peace brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, By the blood of this eternal covenant, this God, what does he do? He equips us. He equips you with everything good that you may do his will. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We're not only called to do the will of God, we are equipped by God to do his will. We over the years have built up quite a collection of of toys and things that our kids have used and and many of you uh, probably have had experience with legos how many of you have ever had a lego kit in your home raise your hand okay lego kits have changed over the years and so kids this might be a shocker but when i was a kid which i actually once was many years ago uh, when i got legos i got a box with legos Uh, I did not get a picture of the Millennium Falcon on the front. Uh, I did not get a picture from some movie set. I got a bunch of blocks, and I had an imagination, and then I went to work, and I tried to build stuff. Now, that's very different. Someone who is a very good marketer along the way figured out that they could sell a whole lot more Legos if they could sell them in these kit forms. And so whether it's Star Wars or some other type of movie or some other type of book, you can buy all these Lego kits now when you buy them that there's a picture on the front that this is what the kit is. And you open it up and there's instructions in there. There's pictures in there. This is what you start with. This is all the components you have. And here's all the steps you follow. And if you follow these steps, then then this is what you'll build. Now imagine, for those of you in the modern Lego age, how frustrating it might be if you all you were given was the picture of the Millennium Falcon and a box of 10,000 Legos, some of which you needed and some of which you didn't need. And you were told, have at it. Now, some of you might come up with something that looked sort of like a spaceship. And you might have come up with something else. But it'd be very difficult to replicate that picture at the end if you didn't have some instructions along the way. Now, why am I talking about Legos? Well, I think there's a picture there of how many of us today view the will of God. Many of us as Christians view the will of God as, here's this picture And we're not sure about the details, but but there's this picture here of being someone who follows the will of God and and does the will of God. And here's all this stuff over here we're given, but we don't have any idea how to get from A to B. And so maybe we, we dump out the box and we start putting some pieces together, but we get real frustrated in the process. But friends, that's not what it is for the Christian to discover the will of God. Now, what God has done is he's given us very specific instructions, even more clearly than those Lego instruction books. He's given us his word, and his word tells us very clearly not only what his will is, his word tells us how we're equipped to do his will. God does not just say to us, well, go out there and do this. No, he empowers us through the Holy Spirit and he gives us his word and he calls us to read it, to study it, to seek to comprehend it. And the more we are in it, the more we see a picture, not only of his will, we see a picture of those who've been called to the will of God in the past. 
We see all these narratives throughout the Old Testament of a person who was called to the will of God and those who followed it and those who didn't and what the consequences were. We're able to see how the will of God works in someone's life and we are equipped then to follow that will today. But that does not come by just taking the Bible blindly and opening up a page and saying, well, God, tell me your will today. Now that comes through a systematic study of the Word of God. And friends, this is why the way that I've led us in handling the Word of God over these last 10 years at Bloomfield Baptist Church is we just walk through books of the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's why we walk through the book of Hebrews. That's why starting next Lord's Day, we're going to start walking through First and Second Samuel. Because as we walk through God's Word, we are better able to understand His will and to see how He equips us to do the things He calls us to. He shows us what we need to do. And primarily what we need to do is we need to trust him by faith and we need to walk by faith. That's why the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11:6 6 says, And without faith it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So how do we please God? We walk by faith. Well, we trust him by faith. And we learn about the faith that's been handed down to us throughout generations through his word. And then lastly, point five, the last reminder. God has blessed us with the word, with the church, and with biblical leadership. God has blessed us with the word, the church, and biblical leadership. These are points that you can see at the very end of this letter. I'll go through them very quickly. Verse 22, I appeal to you brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. That's a word of encouragement. For I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints, those who come from Italy, send you greetings. Grace be with you all. Three things we see here. Verse 22, he says, bear with my word of exhortation. Friends, we are encouraged to listen to God's word of exhortation. Do not neglect the word of God. You will not be a fruitful follower of Jesus Christ if you neglect this word. You do not need to go to the store this week and pick up five different books on how you can better read your Bible. You need to open up this word and read it and be encouraged by it and don't neglect it. Number two, verse 23 said, You should know that our brother Timothy has been released. This is likely a reference to Paul's companion Timothy, his co-laborer in the gospel, who along with Paul was often in prison for the sake of the gospel. And there seems to be a reference here to him being released from prison and then coming to see these believers, this collective group, this, this church of these Hebrew Christians. It's a reminder to us of what a gift the body of Christ is and the church is and the opportunity we have to come together and to gather together and to be encouraged together. God did not call us to be Lone Ranger individual believers. He has called us to come together corporately as his church. And then with that, he's given us leadership. Verse 24, greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. And this is the third reference to that church leadership in Hebrews 13. In verse 7, he said to remember your leaders and their teaching. In verse 17, we looked at this last Lord's Day. He says to obey your leaders and submit to them. That means to listen not only to what were preached, but to apply it to our lives and to yield ourselves to the authority of biblical church leadership. And now he says, greet all your leaders and all the saints. Again, a reminder to us to come together as the body of Christ and to function as God has called us to function. And then that great word at the end, grace be with you all. And my prayer is that grace would be with us. God's grace would be with us as we seek to apply the book of Hebrews to our life. And so I hope today that you've been reminded of some things, specific things, that each of us need to apply in response to his word and I pray that God will keep us through this word and preserve us through this word that one day we might finish the race that he's called us to run. And so I want to take a moment this morning just to pray for that very thing. And again, we're in a different context here. We're not necessarily offering a, an altar call time of invitation, but, but we do want to have a time of response. 
And so before we take some time to sing and respond that way, I just want to take a time to respond in prayer. It may be that this morning as we've been looking to God's word that you've come under conviction. It may be that the Holy Spirit has convicted you specifically of an area where you're not denying yourself and you're not following Jesus. It may be that there's something in your life that you know is not pleasing to the Lord. And then we want to take a moment right now in prayer to, to give you an opportunity to respond to God in prayer, to, to repent and to trust in Him. So I'm going to start us off by praying, and then I'm going to give just some time for all of us just silently to respond to God's Word as the Holy Spirit leads, and then we're going to lift our voices and sing and worship together. So if you would, pray with me. Father, we thank you for your Word of exhortation that you've given us that this word that is given to encourage us, that this reminder to us, Lord, that we are called to trust in you and to walk with you. And so I pray, Lord, that just now in this moment, if there is an attitude in my life or anyone else's life here, if there is a sinful action practice that is evident in my life or anyone else's here, I pray as we just take a moment to, to listen that you would bring us under the conviction of your word and of the Holy Spirit and that we would repent. As Father, I pray in this moment, just as we take a moment now, Lord, that you would draw us to repentance and to faith. Church family, I just want to invite you now in this moment to repent, to to confess sin, and to trust in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're finding today that you've never truly put your trust and your hope and your faith in Jesus. This is an opportunity today for you to respond to God's word, which tells us if we will confess Jesus as Lord And if we believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Friend, if you've never put your trust and your hope in Jesus, would you take this moment to do that now? Father, you tell us in your word that if we confess our sins, that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, I pray today, not that we would be a perfect people, but that we would place our faith in a perfect Savior. And, Lord, that we would walk by faith and not by sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, let's stand together and let's worship together.